The Great Heathen Army, also known as the Viking Great Army, was a mighty force of Scandinavian warriors assembled with one purpose in mind, to invade and occupy the four kingdoms of England. One of the largest Viking armies ever amassed and led by several legendary warriors, it is a fascinating period of history that changed the face of England forever. But what is the truth behind the legend? Let's find out together right now. For many years, the shores of England had been exposed to relentless Viking raids. Regular small bands of warriors would cross the sea and pillage wealthy, gold-laden monasteries or churches. At this time, England was not the single country we know today, but was instead split into four smaller kingdoms. This fractured nature did not lend itself to a coherent defence against the ever-increasing Viking raids, and many small battles were fought across several years. But in the year 865, everything changed. This is where the story blurs the lines between history and legend, with neither one quite able to prove itself fully against the other. Some believe that the great army of Vikings was assembled simply due to the obvious potential of England and its wealth, and the mutual profit to be had for so many Viking leaders by joining together. Other sources, however, suggest a much more poetic agenda, and that the army was led by the sons of the most famous Viking to ever live, Ragnar Lothbrok, in response to his death at the hands of the English King Ayla of Northumbria. Famous names that evoke emotive responses from many today, following their depiction in successful modern TV shows. Ivar the Boneless, Half Dan Ragnarsson, Uber, and Bjorn Ironside. Whilst both are possible, and indeed plausible, which you choose to believe, I will leave up to you. What is uncontested, however, is that in late 865, this great force of Nordic warriors, believed to number around 3,000, landed in England and encamped in the Isle of Thanet. The usual tributes were offered by the people of Kent, gold, in exchange for peace, but something was different this time. The Vikings would not be so easily bought off. This time, they were here to stay. Using East Anglia as a starting point for the invasion, they rampaged across the land until King Edmund of East Anglia was finally able to offer something to make them take pause, buying a temporary truce with food and horses. This was a clear sign for the Vikings of the incredibly weak position the king found himself in, to be forced to effectively pay them to stay on his land. It was perfect for them, however, as by this point the winter was setting in and war was not waged during winter. They settled in East Anglia, comfortable and well-fed, and waited for the spring. When the land thawed, they moved into Northumbria, which, torn by civil war as it was, was an easy target, and swiftly the city of York fell into their hands. The two squabbling factions of the region quickly realised they only stood a chance if they came together to unite against the Viking threat, and a combined army was formed to lay siege to York and retake the city. They were humbled, however, and defeated easily, with both English claimants to the throne, including King Ayla, killed. A puppet leader was installed by the Vikings, and the army moved on. Slicing across the land like a knife through hot butter, the great force moved now into the Kingdom of Mercia, where in the year 867, they captured Nottingham. The King of Mercia requested help from Wessex, the strongest kingdom in England, and a combined army besieged Nottingham, determined to recapture it. The siege dragged on, however, and with no clear victor looking likely, the Mercians settled on paying off the Vikings. Returning to Northumbria, the great army spent the winter in York before returning to East Anglia the following year and arriving at Thetford. This time, however, King Edmund was not ready to submit so easily, and instead of offering food and horses to buy peace, he decided to fight. Unfortunately for him, however, he had underestimated the strength and ferocity of the Viking warriors and was defeated. Some sources claim the Vikings offered him the choice between abandoning his religion or death. His decision to die earned him the nickname Edmund the Martyr. He was tied to a great oak tree and filled full of arrows before his head was cut off. The Vikings went on to pillage many of the churches in the region, decimating the local landscape. In 871, a second Viking force landed in England to bolster the successful great heathen army. This was led by Bagseg, the combined armies now turned their attention to Wessex, the great power in the south of the country. Following several minor encounters, a fierce battle took place at Ashdown, where the Vikings suffered their first major defeat at the hands of the king's brother, Alfred. 
Bagsag was slain, along with many other Jarls of the Viking force. Three months later, the King of Wessex died and the throne was passed to Alfred, who would later become known as King Alfred the Great. With the fighting raging on, Alfred bought the Vikings off with a huge tribute, primarily to buy himself some time to establish a hold over his new kingdom. During this time, a rebellion took place in Northumbria against the puppet ruler the Vikings had installed. They were forced to move their army back north to deal with the issue and restore their rule. By 874, the Vikings found themselves in Repton, a town in Derbyshire. It was whilst based here that they drove the Mercian king into exile and finally conquered the region, replacing the king with another puppet, Sherwolf. It was at this point that a significant decision was taken to split the army into two bands. One half, led by Halfdan, went north into Scotland, where he would pillage successfully, fighting against the local Picts and Britons. In 876, this half of the army would return south from Scotland and share out the lands of Northumbria amongst the soldiers, who settled and began to plough the land, creating a permanent legacy in England that would change the social development of the country forevermore. This land became part of what was to be known as the Danelaw. The second band, however, led by Guthrum, spent the next year raiding and pillaging back southwards, eventually forcing Alfred to act, and war broke out again. Fierce battles would follow, but eventually in 878, Alfred was able to win a decisive victory at the Battle of Eddington, which led to the Treaty of Wedmore. This was a significant moment, as it saw the willing baptism of the Viking leader Guthrum. While some fighting did continue over the next decade or so, with other Viking bands arriving to try their luck, and smaller raiding parties continuing to pillage, many see this moment as the final act of the true Viking invasion into England. Guthrum would withdraw eventually to East Anglia, where he would rule as king until his death in 890. By 896, most Viking attacks had ceased, but the impact on England remained immense. The great heathen army had left a permanent mark on the country, with Vikings still ruling in northern and eastern England. Whilst Alfred had been the only king able to truly resist and maintain his rule in Wessex. As such, the Viking invasion of England changed forever the social evolution of the English people, with the clash of cultures blending and fading into one over the years as is often the way. A fascinating period of history made all the more gripping by the mysterious mixture of legend and history, as well as some of the most famous Vikings to ever live. Were the sons of Ragnar successful in avenging the death of their father? You would have to say yes, and then some. Whether that was the truth behind the invasion or not, you cannot deny that they left their mark on the history of England forevermore. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more great stories. Cheers.